Hello and welcome. He's often called the king of Bollywood, and almost everything he touches turns to gold. But he certainly faced a lot of challenges on the path to his remarkable stardom. This week on 101, meet the man long considered the Indian film industry's hottest property, Shah Rukh Khan. Few could have predicted the incredible success of this baby born in India's capital, New Delhi, although Shah Rukh Khan showed early promise as a performer at home. His parents, Mir Taj Mohammed and Latif Fatima, a photogenic couple, passed away while he was still young, leaving him feeling a little lost. Shah Rukh's passion for and ability in sports were never fully realized because of early injuries, pushing him into other interests such as acting. A trip to India's film capital, Mumbai, launched him quickly into Bollywood's limelight, and he continued to knock out one blockbuster after another, from Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, one of his many famous collaborations with his close producer friend Karan Johar, to colorful epics such as Devdas. In spite of his remarkable omnipresence, at heart, Shah Rukh Khan remains a relatively private person and dedicated family man, and remarkably down to earth. Not bad for a superstar who initially thought he'd just try out a little acting. Shah Rukh Khan, what a delight to talk with you. Thank you, Riz, and uh, thank you to uh, call me on the show, and really wonderful to see you again. Now, not to massage your ego, because it's widely known. You're pretty much at the top of the game. Your, your, your status as an actor is way beyond pretty much anyone else has, uh, globally, because the way Indians are so loyal as well. But you've managed to stay at the top for quite a long time now. What is it, what is it you think that you do that, that keeps you so in, in tune with the, the audience? I don't know, my wife tells me I should keep my mouth shut. <laughs> that, that will help her <laughs> to maintain that position. Or oh, maybe that's it. Uh, but uh, honestly speaking, I think I keep it very simple. Riz. I've always kept it very simple. So I wake up in the morning and I'm like, can I get that one shot right? Like I thought 20 years ago, that I hope I get that shot right. And I keep telling my wife, you know, I find it strange. I'm 44 now and uh, I wear makeup to work. Uh, hey, maybe okay. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we are all the same. Yeah, but, but I find it that you know I've kept it so simple. I'm not bothered about um, you know what I'm going to do through the world of cinema for the world. No, I just want to make a film in which I am able to tell you a good story. So I think that really, keeping it simple and keeping it real, like everyone says, a lot of people in America keep it simple, keep it real. I think that really is the mantra. Nothing else. Do you still feel challenged as an actor, though, considering all the diverse roles you've done? I do now, uh, because, you know, I've reached an age where I'm noticing people are not giving me the kind of roles which were just run-of-the-mill and happy-go-lucky, you know, just come and let your hair fly in the air and sing a song in Switzerland and take the girl in your arms and run. Uh, suddenly, I've passed that age, I realize that, and my friends and filmmakers now don't come with, it's a love story uh, or it's an action film. I think they are, uh, they are challenging me. Let me take you back in time. Born in New Delhi, uh, what were those early years like? I remember them uh, post, f I think, after I was uh, six years old. I remember it very vividly because Delhi, beautiful cold fog. And I remember sitting on uh, uh, the ledge of this, uh, you know, uh, Delhi houses have verandas, small bungalows. So I used to sit on this wall and my father told me that girls used to pass by and I used to blow kisses to them and say, sweetheart. <laughs> so I used to, I remember that. And I remember my father, uh, there was a girl who walked into a house. This is my first memory. And it's, it's very, very vivid. Uh, a girl walked into a house from the uh, co uh, convent of Jesus and Mary. She must be ninth or tenth. And she walked in and told my dad that your son sits on this wall and blows kisses to me. There was this young, handsome man next to a house called Subhash. I still remember his name, Subhash Bhaiya, we used to call him. And my dad thought she's come in the wrong house. Obviously, it's that young boy who's blowing kisses to her. He said, wait, let my son come. And I was taking a bath. And I came running in. I was six years old. And I walked in, and my father, like, you know, this is my kid, darling, and you made a fool of yourself by coming here. I walked in and said, Mwah, hey, sweetheart. <laughs> so he tells me it's one of the most embarrassing moments of my life when he was alive. Uh, post that, um, I, I remember being uh, with my parents, uh, only hearing that my dad was used to be successful. I, I, I was, I was uh, with my dad, and I'm very proud of this. Uh, I'm very proud of this. I think my dad was the most successful failure in the world. I, I read that. Uh, yeah, because that I, I, I was so proud because he spent a lot of time with me. And he, he would not have money. Uh, we would travel in buses, uh, looking forward to buying a half ticket for me because he didn't have the money. You know, change. He used to take out these really, really small five pesa coins which were dirty and he would just pay that off and get me onto the train. Didn't have food money, so he would g uh, so give me groundnuts, peanuts. And I'm not saying we were poor, it's just that he was like that. But he taught me really good things, really, really nice things. Just listening to you, I know he was a very, very big influence in your life and it comes out in the passion when you talk about him. Very sadly, you lost him when you were about 15 years old. Yeah. What did that do to you? Uh, I, I, I thought the world was very unfair. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, if I talk about it, I'll start crying because uh, I was very young, didn't expect it. He was 52. Uh, and, uh, you know, so he had, he had cancer. And uh, all kids think that their fathers are superheroes. I never thought he'll die. I thought, you know, because he was a tough guy, six feet two, very good looking, and uh, really tough. He, he genuinely was a Pathan, so very tough. And I thought nothing can happen to him. And he was the only uh, patient, which I remember again, uh, who didn't lose his hair with chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, we would walk into the hospital, and it was very scary, because sometimes the, do uh, the, the beds used to be empty. He was on a, a common ward. And you'd walk in, and my dad would just look at us and, you know, He'd do this, roll his eyes and say that he's gone. And sometimes you walked in and our dad wasn't there, but he'd gone for chemotherapy. But it was really harrowing. And then one, one fine evening, uh, he just died. You know? He went back to the hospital and he died. And I remember um, our driver had left uh, uh, because of the odd hours. Our driver left the car and he went away. And I had to see my father's dead body and drive my back, mom back home. And uh, I, I didn't know how to drive. I was 15. So I sat in the car and I started driving. And we reached home and my mom said, uh, when did you learn how to drive? And I said, I don't know. I just did. I'd never learned how to drive. And it was this strange thing that my father had died. I was driving a car and my sister was really shocked. She felt sick. She's never recovered. She still hasn't recovered. She's much better off. Uh, but it was really, really shocking, really shocking. And uh, it's something I've never been able to get over. And I tell everyone, everyone asks me my belief in God. So at the age of 15, I started getting angry with God. I used to be like, Allah, why did you do this to me? While I was still uh, angry and fighting with God, everyone does, my mom died. Yeah, soon after, wasn't it? So, so I continued, uh, still being angry with God. So this is really unfair. And then, I last, uh, since she's died a uh, year later, and till now, 20 years, I'm the hugest star with so much love. I've been thanking God. So my relationship with God has been so long, fighting, anger, disturbance, thank you, thank you, thank you, that I'm, I think, suddenly become a great believer in God, you know? Your parents were a great influence in, in many ways because they represent what India is about to so many people. And that is that though you're a Muslim family, they taught you to, to read uh, other religions and understand other religions too. Well, my father was really wonderful like that, and so was my mother. <coughs> he would take me for namaz. He would take me to the Eidgahs. We did everything that a Muslim is supposed to do. Uh, we did our wazu, we did our namaz, we did the Quran, um, everything. Uh, we were a, 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 a fairly uh, strict, proper Muslim family. And everything was followed to the T. But in the same uh, breath, I was acting in Ramlilas as, as, as part of the Hanuman Sena. So I knew the Hindu culture. And because I was in a Christian school, um, I was learning the Bible also. And my father would tell me, and strangely what happened is, when I read the, uh, the, uh, the Gita and the Ramayan, it was in Hindi. I understood it. When I read the Bible, it was in English. I understood it. And my father suddenly turned around and said, you know what, you got to understand Islam also in English. So read it. Read all the books and make up your mind. Know that you're Muslim and Islam means tolerance. So first thing is get tolerant towards all the religions. So I, I try to do that with my kids. Of course, it's changed. I make them read all this on the internet now. You know, it's all there. Uh, but I, I try to teach them. So that was really, really wonderful of them. Interesting, you mentioned about Hindi because you actually that was your worst subject in school, wasn't it? Until your mother gave you the incentive of yeah. uh, studying it so you could go to a movie. Yeah, she told me that uh, I used to get zero or one out of ten, those marks out you of ten. You were good in, in other subjects, though. I, I was good in other subjects, yeah. I was good, so and was teachers good. used to love Hindi me. Hindi was a problem subject. Hindi was pathetic. Uh, Hindi was pathetic. And also, I think I had this little, uh, uh, you know, uh, being in an English-speaking school, I had this superiority complex. And I, I looked down upon, you know, we, we were cooler, way cooler <laughs> than to learn Hindi and Urdu and stuff like that. We used to speak Urdu in, at home, Persian, Arabic. Uh, but I just never looked at it. Then mom said, you get 10 on 10 and I'll uh, take you to watch a m movie. And the movie was Joshila with Devan and Saab. And I just found out six months back that Mr. Yash Chopra had directed it. And it was an action film and he said, I don't know yet why I directed that film. I have no to do. I've never, never, never done an action film. I just did this film. It was shocking. I didn't know he had directed it. I worked so closely with him. He just told me six months back. He had read in an interview. So uh, I got 10 on 10. And it was a spelling uh, exam. And I went to see my first movie in Vivek Cinema Hall in uh, Pusa Road near Delhi, uh, Rajendra Nagar. And uh, I was thrilled. It was a great film. But it's interesting because then you, the life changed. You went from, uh, from uh, New Delhi to Bombay, Mumbai, as it is now. Mother died in 91, and uh, 81 dad had died, 91 mom died exactly 10 years later, and uh, I was very depressed. And by then, television, some work had happened, and people started calling me, and the first call came from Hema Malnizi, and I wouldn't believe it. She said, hello, this is Hema, and I would like, it can't be, you know, there's somebody's uh, yeah, pulling my leg. And then uh, after mom died, I took one of those calls seriously and really asked, is that Hema Malnizi? And she said, yes, I want you to do a film. 
I didn't want to be in films. Uh -huh. And I say that with uh, not being derogatory, just that I didn't think I was cut out for Hindi films. I wasn't that good. But I came to Mumbai, told my girlfriend then, who's my wife now, and my sister, who, wasn't, who was very unwell, very, very unwell. And I told a few of the family members, that I go to Mumbai for a change, one year. I told my friends in theater, I'm going for one year. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll go there and you know, just for, I don't want to, I, Delhi reminds me of my mom and dad, small house, I had nothing, I had nothing left. And I'm like, you know, I just go for a year. My wife was against it. She said, oh, you'll become a movie star, then you'll sleep around with heroines and you'll do nonsense. So I'm like, listen, one year, I just want to go. So she's okay, I'll get married to you, we'll go. So she got married to me. I came for a year. My friends are still waiting. Uh, whenever <laughs> I meet them, they say, Shahrukh, you said you're coming back after a year. And I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll, as soon as they uh, throw me out, I'll go. Right now, they're employing me. Well, things change. I'm going to ask you more about that in a moment. We're taking a very short break here. More with Shahrukh Khan. Welcome back. You're watching 101. We're speaking with one of India's leading stars, Shahrukh Khan. You, uh, where was the turning point for you? Where was it that you felt things really changed in your life? I, I did television for luck. I was doing theater. One didn't take it so... I wanted to be a sportsman. I, I would have dedicated my life to be uh, representing Indian hockey. I loved hockey and I wanted to be a hockey player. But I hurt myself and parents dead. Uh, unfortunately, in India at that point of time, there was nothing like a professional sportsman. I didn't know where I was headed. I did a television series because they were paying well, 1,500 rupees per episode, which is a lot of money. And uh, that became... I remember I was driving down on a, in a three-wheeler after the first couple of episodes. And there were this, uh, two women uh, driving next to me. And suddenly they looked at outside and said, Abhiman, you die! Abhiman, you die! And I was shocked. I'd never felt that there would be people who don't know me who will just kind of smile looking at me. And that's the first time I realized, uh, even before I gave my first autograph, I thought, wow, this is good. This is nice. People are liking me more than I think they should. And I still believe that. I still think so. I mean, I've, that, that thought has never left my mind. I'm getting a little more than I deserve in terms of people loving me. And uh, I, I, I just said, okay, maybe I'll do some more. And uh, I wasn't so trained an actor or so good. I'm, I was just only trying. And then when I came to Mumbai, people gave me roles which were very radically different. I was a bad guy. And I found that nice. You know, I was from theater. I used to take things seriously. And I'm like, yeah, to play a bad guy, low light, eyes like this. You know, the theater guys are like this, morbid and black. So I'm like, yeah, that would be nice. My friends will be very proud of me. And everyone told me, what are you doing? You can't become a villain. You, you, you'll be finished. But I was here only for a year. So I said, okay, I just do it for a year. And they became huge successes. And then suddenly it started being told, oh, he's a different kind of an actor. So I just felt really, really, really accepted, loved. Awards quite a big thing, of course, in your profession. And uh, 1992, Dewana, was your first major film award. How did things change? Uh, Were people paying attention to awards in those days and saying, OK, this is the next one? Oh, I mean, yeah, a lot. I mean, you know, people said you paid for your awards. People said it's difficult to get an award. People said you had to be really nice to uh, the companies who were doing these awards, uh, media companies. And I didn't know anyone. And I do remember that I, I, I'm, I'm at fault, and I'll say it today, I haven't said it ever, that the gentleman who was heading the award, I remember I met him once, and I said, you know something, you're a cheat. You only pay, and I hadn't gotten an award. And he had said nothing to me, poor guy, and he's a friend now. And I said, you're a cheat, and you pay, I've heard you uh, give awards to people who pay, pay, pay you money, and I don't have money, okay, but I have the talent, and all the nonsense I told him, I remember in Mud Island. And, uh, and I felt so stupid. When I got two of them in the same year, you know, I was given an award and I felt really humble and really stupid. And till date, I haven't gone and told him this. this is the first time I'm mentioning it. But I couldn't go up to him and say, you know, I'm really sorry I said that. Because when I got the award, the next day I was told, see, he must have paid for it. So I was like, uh-oh. But it, it felt really nice. I mean, I, I remember I had this image of this film director who's made uh, uh, Three Idiots Now, the producer, Vinod Chopra, was a close friend. When I was young and in Delhi, my mom was alive. We used to watch a lot of TV. And I saw him take his mother, old mother, onto the stage to accept his first Filmfare Award. And I do remember that I got mine first, and my only image in life was, I'd like to take my mom on stage. And I thought she'll always be young. I didn't think she'll be that old. And when I got it, she wasn't alive. So I dedicated that award to her, saying that, I'm going to become such a big movie star, that wherever you are in the heaven, I'll be on such big screens, and it's, it's, <laughs> I'm very sentimental about it. Wherever you are, you'll be able to see, uh-oh, I can see him clearly now without glasses. He's doing well. So I, I dedicated that to her, and uh, I've got like 13 of them now, and, I'm, uh, and I've got lots of other awards from other uh, companies, I think 60, 70 of them. What's unique about you, though, is that uh, unlike many who in, in the Bollywood system are part of a family or a tradition have got this sort of... You, you're actually a rank outsider, really. Well, I'm still an outsider. I, I'll be honest. I'm quite a misfit. 
Uh, I, when I started, like I said, because I had nothing to lose, so I did some radically strange different roles. Mm -hmm. And once I did that, I think it gained me in confidence that, okay, you know, you can be different. Uh, I would do roles with film and filmmakers who were not considered commercial. Uh, I did offbeat films, and I did films with newcomers. And uh, suddenly I did romantic films oppositely. So somewhere down the line, I think I gained in confidence that being from outside is actually an advantage because you have nothing to lose and nothing to prove. I think the issue would be, inshallah, that when my children want to be actors, my daughter and my son, they will be having this pressure that, oh, oh, their family, they have to keep up to the name. I had to keep up to nothing. I have to keep up to nothing. I can just come. Nothing to lose, you know. I think the advantage of a person from outside Mumbai or outside the family business of Mumbai is that, you know, you can do anything. Nobody will know if you lost. But the pressure of being, I feel really bad for the kids, girls and boys who are from the industry. You know, everybody's comparing. The dad was better. No, no, no. He's not as good. He is good, but I feel the pressure is immense and very unfair. So I think uh, the good part was this. And because I was from outside risk, I, I could play it off the cuff. I didn't know what there was to lose, actually. So I still, now I know. Now I'm scared. Now I'm quite wimpy. Now I'm worried about the career. Now I think 10 times. But that time I wasn't scared. I wish I could be like that even now. How, how do you cope with the scandals or, I say scandals, but the gossip and the, the, the stuff that the press is really always keen to try and dig out stuff and pitch you against so-and-so or say your life is like this or you do this? How do you cope with all that? Earlier when I was young and when they uh, uh, took out gossip about me, then I would fight with them physically. You know, I was like a gunda from Delhi. So I'd go and bash them up and get caught. I've been jailed also once uh, for misbehaving yeah. with one magazine. And uh, a couple of times I've been, uh, you know, uh, treated quite badly and rightly so. Uh, uh, that was younger and stupider. Now I'm older and less stupid. Uh, now I've gotten over it. Also, I've not done very, very many scandalous things. So it irks you. And then, uh, you know, with contemporary actors, it's been going on for 20 years. Every year, I've been, I'm told that a young newcomer is coming and removing me. Every year, I'm told I'm too old, so I'm getting removed. And every year, uh, I like it what Govinda, the actor, once said. He said, Dunya kuch bhi keh de. So, you know, whatever the world may say, you come and uh, finish it off with a success. So I like to believe that, you know, I can rest all controversies with my work and that's how I uh, see it. You, you also had incredible success overseas. Does it surprise you sometimes you get a medal from France or the top honor in Malaysia? Yeah, it, it, it is uh, uh, really shocking because, you know, some of the countries that I've got medals from, they don't even understand the language. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, so it's, uh, it, it's really strange and I can feel the love, like in Malaysia, Indonesia, France, Germany. You also, you, you always were passionate about sports, as you mentioned, but the injuries stop you really taking it up. Because you were a good cricketer at one time. I was a very good wicketkeeper, a bad batsman, uh, but I, I kept wickets very well. So and now you're you you now owner of cricket team. Yes, now I have a team. You know, this is what I said to you. If, if, if you know, uh, when, when a lot of people ask me, you're such a big star now, don't you feel that your privacy, you don't even want to just walk on the beach uh, and just enjoy the sunset. So I told them, I, I say jokingly, please, people think I'm being pompous. I say, see, now I'm such a big star. If I want a beach, I buy it. So it was like this. <laughs> so I want to play cricket. I said, okay, let's, that's what I said. I said, you know, I couldn't play cricket. I've hurt myself. And now I'm such a big star. If I want to play cricket, I buy a team. <laughs> but all, all things aside, I really want, in, the, in my own small way, to create a professional platform for sports in the country, cricket, soccer, hockey. Because when I wanted to be a hockey player, I could not be. So I'm hoping that if I bring in a bit of glamour, cricket is something which is uh, like a religion in this country, so people love it. I'll take this platform and get, I would like my son to say at the age of 16, Dad, I, I don't want to study, I want to be a soccer player. And I'd say, okay, go for it, earn your money, have a great life and, you know, study a bit so that you can read every page of the newspaper. Now, you know, just, just an aside, uh, I know you and I have talked about this uh, off camera before, but the sort of delights of arriving at uh, airports in America <laughs> and finding that suddenly you're, you're, you're st you, you actually were the, uh, the center of a diplomatic in, uh, incident in 2008. Um, just how, how did that leave you feeling about the way, you know, when tra traveling as a person like you do, uh, what, what's in store for you? The only problem I have is, see, I wake up late and I'm always nearly missing flights. When I'm in America, especially the domestic flights, and it's, it's very ironic that, you know, for the international flights, it's still okay. Mm -hmm. But domestic flights, I have to go two and a half hours earlier because my name would be picked up. I'm going to be searched. And it's a little embarrassing that, you know, earlier on, I wasn't used to it, but now I'm very well prepared. Sometimes you had strange things in your handbags, yeah. you know, and then they open it, and they're like, what is this? And you're like, oh, oh I don't want you to see this. <laughs> you know, it's odd. <laughs> so now I have to oh, pack nice. my handbag. I have to... <laughs> I have to pack my handbag with a lot more care because I know it's going to be open. I need to go to the airports earlier. But having said that, I think uh, it, it, 
I, I, philosophize, I, I philosophize it now a little. I'm, I'm like, okay, this is the world we've created. And uh, a part of the world is going to be angered, paranoid, and disturbed because of the other part of the world. We can't change it. These are the rules we are making, so I have to subject myself to it. Having said that, whenever I have to travel to America, I'd rather do seven, eight jobs. I line them up. I line them up, and I say, okay, let me go now, get frisked, uh, do whatever I have to do in security, finish off all the jobs and come back so that I don't keep going back uh, in America. But other places also, I think the name does crop up. In France, it does. Uh, I've been honored there, but it does. In England, it does sometimes. A lot of Asians who love me. But I have to follow the process, and um, you know, you say, okay, the kids enjoy it. They're taken to the side, they feel special. Couldn't it be more ironic, though, that to, to get stopped promoting a film about profiling, My Name is Khan, and of course, the, the whole twist in the Yeah, whole. I was finding it very embarrassing, and I didn't want to say it. Uh, you know, and uh, there was this conspiracy theory it could be because of the film. I'm like, no, no, no. See, I was just mentioning to them, I, and I didn't keep, I didn't say it, that, you know, the film is about this. I said, I just made a film here. Of course, the gentleman that time asked, oh, you can make films in America? So I said, yeah. Then I got scared that maybe we've launched this company here and it's illegal. <laughs> so I said, uh, yeah, maybe, you know, whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's quite ironic and it's strange. Uh, uh, in Hindi, they say, jaisa des, vesa bhes. Uh, uh, you know, in Rome, do as the Romans do. So yeah, okay. You go to Rome, you have to do as the Romans do. It's okay. I always feel stupid asking this question, which I always end the show with when I'm sitting in front of someone like you. But if you were to be remembered a certain way, if you were to leave a legacy, what would it be? What would you like it to be? I, I, I'd like to uh, be remembered as someone who tried and tried very hard. Um, I'm always trying. I, I always say, tell my wife also, even, even I, uh, there's a little book I'm writing and I, I've written it, that uh, please remember me as someone who tried and tried very hard. Uh, whether I succeeded, I don't want to be remembered as. Did I fail? I hope to God I'm not remembered as that. Uh, did I do well or not is not important. If people can remember me as, uh, you know what, he was a trial. He tried very hard. I don't mind some people turning around blaming me. You know, I think he tried too hard. Or he tries too hard. A lot of people say that. He tries too hard. That's okay. But at least I tried. I'd like to be remembered. Uh, my legacy should be to my kids, especially. I, to be really honest, if people don't remember me otherwise, it's okay. I think they've given me enough. But I really would like my kids to remember me as, you know, my dad, he tried. He tried very hard, yeah. Shah Khan, I wish you a long and very successful life. Thank, Thank you, you so you much. Thank you so much. Really a pleasure. Thank you.